Good morning, it's Austin Peterson. It's Wednesday, it's 7.06. It's time to rise in freedom. Sorry for my tardiness today. I try and start at 7 a.m. start sharp, but sometimes things go wrong back here and I have to start just a little bit later. Thanks so much for being patient. Glad to have you here. Nice to see you all here. Good morning, good morning. Uh, This morning we're going to talk about a poll that showed the loss of white suburban female voters to the Republican Party from the Democrats. You never thought you'd see it happen. Where are all the white women at? Well, they're not with the Democratic Party, that's for sure. We're going to talk about the libertarian candidate in Arizona for U.S. Senate dropping out and endorsing the Republican candidate, Blake Masters in his race against astronaut Mark Kelly. It's getting kind of wild and wet, wet and willy out there. It's weird. <laughs> wet and willy? <laughs> wet and woolly. <laughs> How am I feeling today? Wake up, IP. Tony Lavasca will be joining us this morning as Missouri State Representative to talk about pandemic amnesty. Boy, people were really triggered yesterday when I was calling out a bunch of conservative Republicans for giving in to lockdowns back in the early days of the pandemic, there are plenty of right-wingers who stood for lockdowns and for mandates in the early days and who didn't say a thing about it when it was Republicans doing it, didn't say a thing about it when Republicans were spending us into oblivion and causing all this inflation that we were experiencing. So the fact that I pointed that out really triggered people yesterday. But should there be a pandemic amnesty? Well, sure. But first, Trump has to apologize for appointing Anthony Fauci. (laughs) All right, all right, I won't trigger you anymore. Sure, it's those evil Democrats that did it all. Uh, Tony Lovasco will join us at 7.30 this morning to talk about that. Judge Andrew Napolitano will join us. It is Wednesday, after all, at 8 a.m. to talk about the possibility that we might ban TikTok for national defense reasons here in the United States. I gotta say, I think that, you know, finally, in some sense, you know, the war hawks, the National Defense Hawks might actually have a good point on this one, specifically because it's it's an app created to monitor American citizens by the Communist Chinese. We'll talk about that with Judge Knapp at 8 a.m. And then at 8.30 this morning, I'm delighted to introduce to you for his first time on the show today, Noah Rothman, who will be joining us today to talk about the rise of right-wing comedy. Why are right-wing comedians getting so much traction out there? And why is left-wing comedy dead? Have you watched any of these late-night talk shows with Jimmy Kimmel or any of these other guys? It's pretty terrible stuff. Well, we'll talk about all that and more on the Wake Up America show. Good morning, Rise and Freedom, Corey Kleiber. My friend uh, Cassie Scanlon. Sorry, it's a little hard to see that over there. Hey, Cassie, nice to see you. Doug H., Jose Palacios, Michael Nip. Good morning to you all. Glad to have you here. Chris Morrill, Quest Fanning, all of our freedom friends on the Wake Up America show. We're delighted to have you here. All right, let's cut that music off. It's time for us to talk about the news. First story, the big story that I want to hit today, this uh, story about the Libertarian Party candidate in Arizona dropping out and endorsing Blake Masters has really triggered the internet. I saw this morning that the word libertarians were tre- was trending on Twitter, which is usually not a good thing. <laughs> it's usually a bad thing because the left is feeling very triggered. Um, uh, Andy Craig over on Twitter said, I know I shouldn't make fun of somebody's name, but libertarians for Masters is a bit ridiculously on the nose. Okay, good point there, Andy. The editor should should have sent that one back to the writers as, quote, too obvious. Um, a lot of libertarians very triggered by the candidate, the Libertarian Party candidate out in um, out in uh, uh, Arizona endorsing um, Bl- Blake Masters. Donnie Ferguson, who I used to work for uh, with, uh, we used to not work for, but Donnie Ferguson uh, on Twitter, uh, he and I are friends. We used to work together at the Libertarian Party back in 2008, said three things to remember. If a Libertarian candidate could influence voters, he wouldn't be getting 2%. Mm, Good point. Two, if libertarian voters did what they were told, they wouldn't be libertarians. Another good point. And three, the LP vote typically breaks evenly three, three ways anyway. One third of them vote for the Republican, a third of them vote for the Democrat, and a third of them would skip. That's right. The libertarian candidate 
dropped out of the Arizona Senate race and endorsed Blake Masters. Masters says that this is another boost of momentum as we consolidate our support. Now, this decision that was announced on Tuesday gives him a bit of a lift, I would say. You know, if if 2% of those people do vote for Blake Masters, that could be the difference maker in a very tight race out in Arizona. But Mark Victor, who was the Libertarian candidate, spoke on Monday with a uh, with Mr. Masters in a 20-minute recorded conversation um, that he published. And uh, essentially, this con- this was a condition for him to quit the race that he offered to have a public 20-minute conversation with the candidate uh, in 100% transparency, and that was going to be the stipulation for if he would drop out and endorse that candidate. Apparently, Mr. Victor made that uh, um, that uh, offering to the Democrat candidate in the race as well, but of course, the Democrat didn't take him up on that one. But Mr. Victors did have uh, quite a bit of money for a libertarian. He'd raised over $100,000 for his campaign, which is, uh, for a libertarian campaign, that's pretty good money. Um, now, Blake Masters has gone out of his way to try and court libertarian, libertarian-minded voters. You know, uh, last Thursday, he posted a, a picture of himself from 2010 with Ron Paul saying he was, quote, honored to have Mr. Paul's endorsement. Mr. Masters also has been on Dr. Ron Paul's podcast and on another libertarian podcast with um, Dave Smith. Uh, And for those who might not know, Dave Smith is like kind of widely considered to be one of the front runners uh, as a possibility for the libertarian presidential nomination uh, in the upcoming 2024 elections. So, um, you know, Ron Paul, uh, Dave Smith, uh, and this uh, Mr. Victors, uh, who is running in uh, Arizona, does kind of bring a lot of libertarian support to the um, to his side. Now, not everybody's happy about this one. As a matter of fact, I was reading Reason Magazine, which is a libertarian magazine this morning, uh, with the title, Arizona Libertarian Senate Candidate Mark Victor Drops Out and Endorses GOP's Blake Masters. Brian Doherty writes this one. And typically, Brian Doherty over at Reason is very even-handed, um, although a hardcore libertarian, so he stands you know, very firm on his principles, but he's not um, like some people in the libertarian movement that are, you know, just there, there is an establishment in the libertarian party. And I think much of that establishment did get washed away during the recent takeover. I won't get too much into the inner politics of the, of the LP because I don't think it really matters much to, you know, you know, putting food on your table at the end of the day. But in terms of, of, of impacting a, an important Senate race uh, in the country, I think that this this does probably move the needle a bit. Just in my opinion, um, other people disagree. Now, um, getting a, an endorsement from presidential candidate Ron Paul is a big deal. You know, getting support from Dave Smith is a big deal. I do think that that moves the needle a bit. Uh, but the problem, of course, is that not everybody agrees with this decision. And, you know, here's the thing. The the Libertarian Party has a lot of the same problems that, you know, Republicans and Democrats do, right? It's a political party in the first place. So if you're a partisan, the people who are in the Libertarian Party are guilty of the same, doing the same thing that Republicans or Democrats do. You have to vote for all Libertarians all the time. And so they're, you know, because their goal is to perpetuate a political party, you know, they get caught up in the same kind of partisanship that Republicans or Democrats do. So, and that becomes a problem. What do you think about this? Send me a text, 573-319-1586. Cassie says she's got to head into work. Have a great day. She'll try and jump in later on her coffee break. Keep up that fight for liberty. Cassie, well, thank you very much for joining us this morning. We hope to see you again. Um, Chris Morrill says that, um, well, I lo- it says that I could see if Masters was a Paul Massey or Mosh type, but he's not. Well, Chris, I wonder then what you think about Ron Paul endorsing um Blake Masters on that one. Um, Rare Camellia says also, this also means libertarians have to have good candidates. She initially said, I'm actually a proponent of the idea that libertarians support good Republican candidates and vice versa. Of course, that means Republicans should reciprocate, which won't happen. Yeah, good point. What do you think? Send us a text, 573-319-1586. We'd love to hear your thoughts about that one. Uh, uh, And, um, do you think that this is going to move the needle out there? Now, most notably, I think former Republican, now um, now uh, Libertarian Justin Amash, he was a member of Congress who uh, quit um, and stepped down from Congress and quit the Republican Party, uh, is very triggered by this one, very triggered by this decision by the Libertarian candidate to drop out and endorse Blake Masters. Now, 
<laughs> this is what uh, Justin Amash tweeted 19 hours ago. He says, I'm a libertarian and Masters is an authoritarian grifting as hard as he can to convince both libertarians and nationalists he's one of them. We disagree on immigration, policing, war, economics, free speech, and more. In all those areas, he wants less liberty and more tyranny. Now, see, that's very interesting because that was in response to a question about what are the differences between you, Justin Amash, and Masters policy-wise. Justin Amash seems to think they're very, very different, which is interesting because, you know, he was endorsed by Congressman Ron Paul. Paul. So, you know, people do kind of look at Ron Paul, uh, I think, a little bit too much as um, they sort of put him on a pedestal a little bit too much. So there's room to criticize Ron Paul. I know, you know, if you want to have a political career as a libertarian, you don't do that. But um, I'm a Republican. <laughs> uh, so quit falling for the BS, says Justin Amash, very triggered. And then he goes on and says, there's maybe no polit bigger political grift than the Republican independent former Republican public figure who now consistently supports Democrats or the Democrat independent former Democrat public figure who now consistently supports Republicans. Mm, not sure. Justin Mosh says this is utterly pathetic. Don't know about that one, Chief. Um, we'll continue this conversation. But uh, when we get back, I do have another topic. Bill Maher had a really great segment last week where he criticized the snowflake generation i'll play that for you don't forget we've got tony lavasco coming up at 7 30 to talk about pandemic amnesty this topic is still burning up the internet people are now calling for a nuremberg 2.0 all that and more on the wake up america show at wakeupamericashow.com shooting things, but whenever I can't shoot something, I like to cut things. My life isn't all about shooting and stabbing and cutting, though. Sometimes I have to do actual work, but when I work, I still like to have fun. And there's nothing less fun than trying to cut with a crappy knife. Thankfully, from the ancient sect of Christian knights, who also loved cutting and stabbing, comes a new implement that has received my personal blessing, the Templar knife. Like the ancient sword of Excalibur, you don't choose a Templar knife, it chooses you. You just decide what kind you want on the website first, however, and then order it online, and then it chooses you. The Templar knife comes in a variety of shapes. As a man of culture and taste, I have decided I will never use a terrible knife again. And thanks to the inspiration provided by this excellent product, I have decided to launch a new crusade against anyone using less than superior knives. Join me, brothers and sisters, by visiting uppercuttactical.com slash pages slash Templar dash knives. That's a lot of slashes. For that, you'll need a Templar knife. For 10% off, use code AP for liberty and join me in a quest for glory, for liberty, for Christendom, for the Templar knife. Get yours today. Fire. Your printing company stinks. They charge you too much money and they don't love America enough. We've got the solution. Patriot Printing USA. Whether you're running for office, saving souls, or just need business cards that will get you the new job you've been looking for, Patriot Printing USA has got you covered with the best prices around. Palm cards, brochures, bumper stickers, door hangers, you name it, we've got it. PatriotPrintingUSA.com. That's PatriotPrintingUSA.com. Want an engaging website to boost your business? You're just a click away from five-star Fiverr talent. Hundreds of freelancer skills like web design. Head to Fiverr.com today and get something started.
Average Americans are turning into conspiracy theorists at an unprecedented rate. Flip City Magazine was created for new converts to aid in their in-depth research along the path of absolute truth. We offer the hardest hitting news and opinion delivered uncensored in print directly to your door. Display proudly on your coffee table or hide discreetly under your mattress. Flip City is the magazine they don't want you to see, much less read. Subscribe to Flip City Magazine today at flipcitymag.com. settle these matters in the courts than on the streets, and new laws are needed at every level, but law alone cannot make men see right. Howdy ho, it's 722. I'm Austin Peterson. You're watching and listening to the Wake Up America Show at wakeupamericashow.com. All right, where are all the white women at? Probably not voting for Democrats, that's for sure. We'll talk about that in just a moment. My friend Lee from New Orleans sent us a message this morning. Good morning, Lee. How are you doing, sir? He says that the Libertarian Party is pro-choice on everything, except for who to endorse? Question mark? Very funny, Lee. Thanks so much for listening all the way down from New Orleans. Glad to have you as a listener this morning, how are you doing today? Send us a text like Lee from New Orleans at 573-319-1586. We'd love to hear from you this morning. All right, white suburban women. Where are all the white women at? They're swinging towards back and Republicans for Congress. They're swinging, AP. Get that dirty thought out of your mind. White suburban women, a key group of midterm voters. Remember, they handed it to Joe Biden back in 2020. No, 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 it was stolen, it was stolen. <laughs> it wasn't all those white suburban women who voted for Donald Trump. Actually, I think more of them voted for Donald Trump the second time than they did the first time. And fewer white men voted for Donald Trump the second time than they did the first time. Isn't that just the weirdest thing you ever did here? Well, that's reality. This key group of midterm voters have significantly shifted their support from Democrats to Republicans in the closing day of the midterm campaigns. And they say it's because of rising concerns over the economy and inflation. This is according to a latest poll from the Wall Street Journal. The new survey shows that white women living in suburban areas make up 20% of the electorate. They now favor Republicans for Congress by 15 percentage points. They moved 27 percentage points away from Democrats uh, since their August, the last poll that was done in August. 27 percentage points. Yikes. That ought to show you that people are feeling the pinch, that's for sure. And it also shows, and I think this is probably most important, it also shows that the topic of abortion rights has faded in importance after Democrats you know, saw some energy on this issue this last summer in the wake of the Supreme Court decision to overturn Roe versus Wade. The Republican pollster, Tony Fabrizio, who conducted this poll uh, with a Democratic pollster, John Anzalone, they did it together, said that we're talking about a collapse in that group on the perceptions of the economy. So the poll showed that 54% of white suburban women think that the United States is already in a recession and 74% think that the economy is headed in the wrong direction. This is that key group of voters that everybody's been talking about that they want to win. And it shows now that they are swinging wildly. I mean, very wildly. That is a humongous shift in perception. Uh, views of the economy amongst this group, white women, white suburban women, uh, were substantially more negative uh, than the last survey that was done in August. So August, September, October, November. I mean, everything is sort of ramping up to what Joe Rogan called in his podcast, a red wave that would remind you of that elevator scene from Stanley Kubrick, The Shining. Right. Remember that scene from the elevator when the blood washes down out of the elevators? 
Uh, that's what Joe Rogan compared it to, what he thinks is coming. In August, 43% of white suburban women thought that the economy had entered a recession, and 59% said the economy was headed in the wrong direction. <laughs> These are huge numbers. And, uh, you know, a lot of different, there's a lot of other voter groups as well, not just white suburban women that are starting to make these changes, at least according to polls that we have, giving a republic, giving the Republicans a boost before election day. White suburban women were a very powerful force in the Democrats getting gaining uh, the House races in, in winning House races in 2018. The party gained more than 40 seats. The Democrats gained more than 40 seats in 2018, and many of those seats were gained in suburban districts. Um, and that's what re gave them control of the House in 2018. Uh, Democrats, though, they really believed that abortion was going to be an issue that would keep these white suburban women in their uh, corner and would turn them out to vote this November. But it looks like the abortion issue is not as important as being able to afford food for their families. So rising prices were the top issues that were motivating these voters. 34% of voters put that as their number one priority. And then 28% uh, cited threats to democracy. So, you know, a, a lot of that brainwashing from M MSNBC and from liberal news outlets has been having an impact. Um, threats to democracy, 28%. That's what white suburban voters, uh, female voters said. And 16%, only 16% only compared to 34% on the economy, only 16% chose the Supreme Court overturning Roe versus Wade as the issue that was motivating them to the the polls. So white suburban women trusted Republicans over Democrats to handle the economy and inflation, and they also expressed more negative views towards the state of the country and President Biden's leadership compared with a previous survey in August. So a total of 85% of these voters said that they were motivated to vote, making them among the most motivated group of those surveyed. So Big time, big time. 66% of white suburban women said rising costs are a major or minor financial strain compared to 54% in August. So as the economy has continued to um, collapse, the uh, white suburban females have started to feel the pinch as they've gone you know, grocery shopping. Susan Smith was interviewed for this. She says, it is impacting us personally. I came out with a few grocery bags and I paid 120 bucks. Oh yeah, it's definitely something that I've been experiencing as well. Uh, when we go to the grocery store, my wife and I, it is pain, 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 painful. All right. I want to play this clip for you. I'm not sure when else I would have an opportunity to do so. That isn't the best segue I've ever made before, but I had to play this clip of Bill Maher. Hilarious. Bill Maher talking about uh, the snowflake generation with their Halloween costumes. He's got a Halloween costume. He's going, at, he went as the snowflake generation this year. Take a listen. What better costume to wear this year than the most ridiculous one I could think of? You. <laughs> This year, I'm going as an uber-woke, overly anxious, perpetually offended 20-something. Would you like to see what I have for this? Yes, I would like to see that. Let's see it. You're going to really enjoy it. Okay. First of all, I have my Fuck the Patriarchy t-shirt. Sorry for the language. Oops. Oh, yes. And then I have a check from the Patriarchy to pay my car insurance. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I've got my uh, my nose ring, <laughs> my I know, uh, my vape pen. <laughs> my vape pen. I've got my cloth surgical mask, <laughs> my surgical mask, my N95 mask, and my face shield. <laughs> <laughs> then after I leave the house. I have my clonopin to take the edge off, my Adderall to put it back on. <laughs> I have my participation trophy, my cat ear headphones to listen to sad music, the stick that goes up my ash, <laughs> and the leash for my support animal. That's good stuff. That's good Just stuff. You aren't going to still doesn't get what I'm all about. You aren't going to want to miss uh, what I have. Uh, Noah Rothman on today, later on in the show, to talk about the rise of conservative comedy, right in the vein of that kind of stuff. That's conservative comedy to me. Bill Maher, left liberal, doing conservative comedy. What do you think about that? Send me a text, 573-319-1586. When we get back, we're going to talk to Tony Lavosco about pandemic amnesty on the Wake Up America show at wakeupamericashow.com. 
Want an engaging website to boost your business? You're just a click away from five-star Fiverr talent. Hundreds of freelancer skills like web design. Head to Fiverr.com today and get something started. American conservatism is distinct, like America is distinct from the United Kingdom. American conservatism's roots comes out of the Wild West, out of pioneerism. The difference between American conservatives and European conservatives is that Americans are cowboys. We are that God, guns, gold, and girls. It's wild here. And we should stay that way. We shouldn't allow a European version of conservatism to come and infect us here. We like it wide open spaces here, you know, deep in the heart of Texas and all that. with Austin Peterson. This show has been a huge venture for our family, so we would love it if you could join us. I believe in liberty, and I believe in Austin's ability to spread the ideas of liberty. Do you? I want to ask you today to join Peterson's Patriots with a pledge of $17.76 a month. Help us to stay cancel-proof so we can spread the message of limited government across the country. I joined Peterson's Patriots myself, just in a little different way. Visit wakeupamericashow.com slash support and make your pledge today. Average Americans are turning into conspiracy theorists at an unprecedented rate. Flip City Magazine was created for new converts to aid in their in-depth research along the path of absolute truth. We offer the hardest hitting news and opinion delivered uncensored in print directly to your door. Display proudly on your coffee table or hide discreetly under your mattress. Flip City is the magazine they don't want you to see, much less read. Subscribe to Flip City Magazine today at flipcitymag.com. Speaker Pelosi's husband, Paul, made a big investment in chips just before Congress votes on a bill that would give $52 billion in subsidies and tax credits to the chip industry. Over the course of your career, has your husband ever made a stock purchase or sale based on information he received from you? No. And I believe if you come to our border, you will be turned back. Do not come. Do not come. Have you ever oh, overseen, have you ever received a royalty playing. payment from a company that you later oversaw money going to that company? You know, I don't know as a fact, but I doubt it. Well, I well here's the thing is, why don't you let us know?
Good morning, Rise and Freedom at 735. You're watching and listening to the Wake Up America show with Austin Peterson. It's time to rise and freedom. All right. One of my favorite guests is coming on today. His name is Tony Lavasco. He's a state representative here from the state of Missouri. He's joining us now. Good morning, Tony. Thanks so much for coming on the show today. Good to see you. Morning, Austin. I thought this was a good this was a good topic because people were quite triggered yesterday when we were talking about this concept of pandemic amnesty, not just triggered by the fact that the left has done so many evils in the name of trying to help us, right? Trying to do good. So many horrible, awful things that the left has done during the pandemic the last two years. And all of a sudden they're they're like, oh, well, let's just call a truce. So I mean, I, I totally understand why so many of our Republican, libertarian, and conservative friends want to go scorched earth on them and destroy them. But there were a lot of Republicans in the very beginning who gave in to pandemic tyranny and shutdowns and lockdowns and mandates and things like that. So if there's any ambulance to be going around, maybe maybe we should have some apologies from our conservative friends who caved in the beginning, too. What do you think? Well, sure. I, you know, I, I will say this. I, I'm not a big fan of amnesty in general here, but uh, <laughs> I would say there is room for nuance. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I don't know if it was you or someone else that, uh, you know, likened this concept to, you know, a, a Nuremberg 2.0. Right. And I, I think it's a good analogy. Uh, I don't think it necessarily serves anybody to hunt down the 97 year old dude that cut the grass at the concentration camp and throw him in prison for the last two years of his life. But I got to tell you, if you were part of the machine and committing atrocities, yeah, you know what? You should have some consequences. And I think it's the same thing. I, I don't know that we need to you know, throw Gavin Newsom's secretary in prison. But <laughs> if you used your office to trample people's rights, if you exceeded your authority under the law and you hurt people, I, I do think there should be consequences, whether that be a civil or criminal penalty in terms of the circumstances. Uh, should we be, you know, purging social media of random trolls who cheerleaded the administration? Well, no, we don't have time for that. There's a lot of idiots who, you know, bought the the line and, and participated in kind of the mob. But, uh, you know, average everyday people who were just idiots about it aren't necessarily the people that I think we should be going after that, you know, but but absolutely, as you pointed out, I, I think this you know cuts both ways. Plenty of Republican governors lock down their states, and I think they should have consequences, too. Yeah. Amen. Uh, if you're just tuning in, we're speaking to state representative from Missouri, Tony Lavasco, talking about the left calling for a pandemic amnesty. See, I kind of saw this as a good sign, Tony, because it showed that the left felt that they had made mistakes. Like the woman who wrote the article talked about, you know, the educational system and, you know, Randy Weingarten and others, how she should be forgiven for locking down schools and keeping kids out of schools. But I'm, I'm kind of like with you on that one, right? Not so fast here. There are people who definitely made mistakes that they should be punished for because because, you know, why should we give them amnesty because they were wrong? I mean, we saw from the very beginning that this was a mistake. We knew from the very beginning that COVID wasn't dangerous to kids, that schools were not the vectors for transmission. So, you know, not everybody should, you know, get a sense of amnesty. And there are certainly people who need to be punished. I mean, but I mean, what do you think should happen to Randy Weingart, Ryan Weingarten or people like um, uh, Tony Fauci? I mean, it's not like they're elected officials. We can't just throw them out of office. Yeah, and I think that's that's an important distinction here. Uh, we need to not be participating in the the you know conservative version of cancel culture. Uh, the fact that somebody ran their mouth and other people that did have power listened to them and abused your rights is not the same as they themselves abusing your rights. You have to look at it directly. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people that were very guilty of making this worse. They were uh, inspiring and in a lot of cases egging on uh, the folks that had the power to hurt people. Uh, but just being a pundit, just being an advisor, uh, you know, Anthony Fauci is entitled to have wrong opinions. And, uh, you know, while, yes, we might look at him lying in front of Congress or other things as potentially criminal violations, and I think we should look at that, uh, you know, the scope of his guilt is different than the person who signs the executive order, who actually, uh, you know, sends the health inspector to go and close the business, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we have to look at all those things in context. But I think really what we ought to be looking at when it comes to, you know, the moral side of things, whether or not, uh, you know, your your aunt that didn't, uh, you know, let your kids come to the Thanksgiving because they weren't vaccinated or whatever uh, should be forgiven on a personal level. Uh, you know, I think that's no different than anything else that we give for forgiveness for in our lives. And, and you have to have some contrition. It's a huge, huge difference to say, you know what? I was wrong to do the thing. It's another thing to say. Well, I shouldn't have done the thing because in retrospect, I was incorrect about my my reasoning. 
right? You know, a lot of these apologies that we've seen or, or pseudo kind of contritions, including the article that, that you cited originally, basically said, well, we didn't know that it wasn't going to work. We didn't know that it wasn't as bad in this area as we thought. And the implication there is, well, if it had been as bad and if it had worked, we still would have been correct. And that, that's where they, they lose me. Because in my mind, it doesn't matter if it works or not. You can't trample someone's rights. You can't lock them in your home, their home. You can't shut down their business on private property just because of some utilitarian arguments that, well, it's going to help more people in the greater good. I mean, that's that's how all atrocities are justified. And, and you know, it's totally different if someone is saying, look, I was completely wrong about my involvement in shutting down those businesses it was never justified i got caught up in it and i just i didn't realize how how evil i was being like eh, okay you know I'll, I'll listen to that it's another thing to say well it's a shame it didn't work uh, sorry i hurt you guys <laughs> one of our listeners sent us a message which i think makes a lot of sense andy opperman this morning said that for those who made the best decision with the information they had at the time and changed that position when they had better information i have no trouble forgiving for those who didn't or doubled down on bad policy for political reasons how can that be ignored i think that makes really good sense you can yeah. text us you can text us too like andy did at 573-319-1586 uh, tony i'd like to move on a little bit to uh, another topic we were talking about during the commercial break about the um the uh, uh the libertarian candidate in arizona uh deciding to endorse the republican party candidate this has triggered a lot of libertarians who think that blake masters is an authoritarian i mean uh what's his name uh, justin amash former republican congressman now libertarian uh, party member is out there saying that blake masters is this authoritarian grifter i mean congressman ron paul endorsed blake masters out in arizona uh and, and dave smith seems to have a high opinion of the guy um what do you think about when third party candidates, libertarians endorse Republicans like you. Sure. I, you know, I, I don't follow that race super closely. I don't have a, a strong opinion on Blake Masters, but is a general rule. Uh, I think that people of all parties need to actually use some common sense about what candidates are going to actually further their ideals and their political agenda and what ones are not. And I don't think it's a problem to endorse or consider the reality that perhaps uh, someone in another party is in a better position to move the football down the field than you are. And and I think that that cuts both ways. Uh, the problem that I think a lot of people had with that situation is this kind of perception that the Libertarian Party's own function is to somehow try to claw their way up to parity with the Democrats and Republicans. And I think that's nonsense. I, I think that the, the Libertarian Party's function is presumably to promote liberty, right? It's right in the name. Um, and if we're going to have any kind of reform in the you know, two-party system that is pretty well ingrained in most environments throughout the country, having a robust set of third parties that add to the dialogue and put people on notice that you know, if you're going to nominate bad candidates, there is going to be competition. I think that's positive across the board. I mean, it's competition, right? Uh, Republicans should not fear third parties. However, at the same time, if you've got a race that's, you know, polling within half of 1% and the, the person getting the half of 1% drops out and endorses one of the two people, that does seem like somewhat common sense that, you know, this this guy was not going to somehow come from behind and win that Senate seat. And what he did was he made a very bold and honestly a very principled stance that his personal ambition was, you know, take the second place to, you know, picking the best candidate of the available field. And right, maybe this Masters I'm, guy isn't that amazing. Maybe he is. I don't know. But he's almost certainly going to be better than the Democrats. So, you know, why on earth wouldn't you at least consider that as a viable option? That's quite a pragmatic view uh, from Tony Lavasco. Tony, it, I mean, it would be like if, if a libertarian candidate were running in your race against you and the Democrat and trying to paint you as just some, you know, insider Republican, just like the, the Democrat. I mean, like, you know, if, if there was a libertarian in that race, you damn right that I would be putting a lot of pressure on that guy to drop out and endorse you because, I mean, you're pretty much the most libertarian Republican that we have. But I mean, it, you know, unfortunately, I think what happens is that libertarians uh, who are party members will, because of the party mentality, they get caught up in the same kind of like partisanship that Democrats and Republicans do. And they put their parties over the party over their principles to a, to a certain degree. Would you agree? 
Oh, absolutely. I, and, you know, I, I think that it works the other way around. If all of a sudden Ron Paul moved to District 64 and decided to, you know, run as a libertarian against me you know, next term because I took a bad vote or something, <laughs> you know, I'm going to look at the polls and I'm going to, you know, I'm probably not going to beat Ron Paul and he's a pretty great guy. So maybe I ought to sit this one out. Like sure. the point of being involved involved in politics is not to you know get your name on the door the point is to move the football and advance the agendas that you care about and libertarians and and libertarian republicans and and whatever labels we want to put on folks if you're fighting for liberty the goal should be liberty and that's it and it's you use whatever tools you got to to make that happen if you're just tuning in, we're speaking to Missouri State Representative Tony Lavasco. You can send us a text, 573-319-1586. Tony, how do you feel about the upcoming midterm elections? You think um, it'll be what uh, Joe Rogan said? He said it'll be like um, that elevator scene from The Shining, a red wave just bleeding out all over the country. What do you think, Tony? You feel optimistic? I am optimistic. I don't think it's going to be quite that that exciting. I, I think uh, you know we're going to definitely take back the House. I think uh, there's a very good chance we'll make the Senate by maybe a vote or two. Um, I think it's going to be a good day for sure. I think the real question is going to be, uh, how do we move forward? Uh, my biggest concern is us winning by a small margin. I would rather see us take the House by a huge amount and lose the Senate than take both houses by like two or three votes. Because ultimately what's going to happen is the Biden administration is going to put pressure on a handful of wishy-washy folks to switch their votes and vote with the Democrats. And Biden's still going to get what he wants, except for now they can say it's bipartisan. And, and that, doesn't, that doesn't advance liberty at all either. Um, I would like us to see us hold the line somewhere, uh, whether it would be you know in the Senate or the House. I, I think I'd probably prefer the Senate, but I don't think that's a strong preference. The real thing is we have to make sure that at least for the next two years, uh, we can stop the, the train moving forward. Uh, to to making things worse and worse here in this country. How do you feel about your race, Tony? Well, considering I'm unopposed, I'm pretty good. I just got to make sure to vote for myself, and I'll I'll be good. <laughs> <laughs> state Representative Tony Lavasco from the state of Missouri. We appreciate you very much, Tony. Thank you for your time today. Thanks, Austin. Uh, must be nice. Run out unopposed. What do you think about Tony Lavasco there? Send us a text, 573-319-1586. I got to get me one of those unopposed races next time I run. How about that one? <laughs> Try to run for president of the United States. What do you think? Coming up next at 751, TikTok could be banned for national security purposes. We'll talk about that. And then Judge Napolitano will weigh in uh, after that on the Wake Up America show at wakeupamericashow.com. as a medic to be there to help my patients and after an injury I found myself as a patient. I experienced post-traumatic seizures. Depression is a big one that comes along with it, PTSD. So I pursued my PhD in neuroscience and regenerative medicine. The coalition has helped fund my academic pursuits. They genuinely care about helping the vet in whatever way that they can. Through supporting the coalition, you're supporting some of the veterans that have the biggest needs. Visit saluteheroes.org to learn more. If there wasn't going to be somebody who was a fiery champion of liberty, somebody who would who would get out there and who would be aggressive, and if they wouldn't do it with more fire or passion than I had, then I would go and I would fight this battle for us. I've fought for the principles that we all share. Parties tend to be secondary to me. We're here because we believe in the principles of liberty. I am not a perfect messenger, but I think I'm a damn good one. This is a replica of our first president's flintlock pistol. You have my full support, my respect, and my gun. matter are lies to be encouraged instead of punished this is not our inheritance if truth no longer matters we will not remain free for long 
This is our generation's challenge, to defend our founders' hope that we the people could self-govern if we defend our right to get the facts. And right now, we're building the only defense a free people have, the facts on every politician, every position they held, every statement they've made, every vote they've made, and any cash they've taken. It's the real history on those now pandering for your vote. There are hundreds of young people building our defense right now, and they need your help. We all have our passions, but as our ancestors knew, when events become so foul they threaten us all, we must stand and defend each other. Please, have our backs. Join us at votesmart.org. What would happen if, if I had to pick up the phone, call 911 for one of my family members or one of my neighbors? What would I do if, if no one was on the other end to respond? What if there was no 911? So you can be a part of the solution. Anybody can be a firefighter, male, female, younger, older. We are school teachers. We are leaders in business. Is me, you, anyone that wants to be. There is no typical firefighter. We wish you a freedom Christmas, we wish you a freedom Christmas, we wish you a freedom Christmas and a Liberty New Year. Socialists and commies may try to convince you that the holiday's all about free stuff, but let's be honest, we all know whose wallet Santa's gifts are coming out of. There ain't no such thing as a free stocking. <laughs> Santa is the only guy with a big white beard promising free stuff that we want anything to do with this holiday, and if you don't believe, you don't really receive. It's a capitalist, consumerist holiday, and it's time for a Santa-sized stimulus. Get your free market merch at the AP for Liberty shop today and stuff your socialist sister's stockings full of capitalist cheer. Ho, 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 ho. Good morning. Welcome back. Austin Peterson here on the Wake Up America show at wakeupamericashow.com. All right, TikTok. I know it annoys the hell out of some of you, but the kids love it. Well, my now we crotchety, you know, geriatric millennials and boomers and Gen X, we might get our way to ruin their day. Gen Z should get ready for me. The U.S. should ban the video sharing app TikTok to prevent China from stealing data on American citizens. This is according to the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC Commissioner, Brendan Carr. He said it's on Tuesday. Carr is one of the five commissioners who lead the FCC. He argued uh, in an interview with Axios that there is no way to have sufficient confidence, this is or his words, that Americans' data on the app is not being sent back to Beijing and the Chinese Communist Party. TikTok is owned by the Chinese tech giant ByteDance, and Chinese law mandates companies share their data with the CCP upon request. Now, TikTok is currently litigating with the U.S. Council on Foreign Investment to determine whether it's possible to divest the app from ByteDance and allow it to operate in the United States. And this is something that Donald Trump was going for back when he was still in office. But the FCC chair says that the data protections won't be secure enough regardless of what deal is reached. He says that I don't think that there is a path forward for anything other than a ban, he told Axios. A world in which you come up with sufficient protection on the data that you could have sufficient confidence that it's not finding its way back into the hands of the CCP. Now, TikTok has been pushing back on this after this statement, arguing that the commissioner has no role in litigation. The FCC has no authority to regulate TikTok, which is why Carr and other others who are critical Critical of the app have urged other federal agencies in Congress to take action. TikTok said that Commissioner Carr has no role in the confidential discussions with the U.S. government related to TikTok and uh, uh, appears to be expressing views independent of his role as an FCC commissioner. They are confident that they are on a path to reaching an agreement with the U.S. government that will satisfy all reasonable national security concerns. I'm curious to to know what you think about this topic. Do you think that TikTok should be banned? And, you know, uh, 
as a libertarian, you know, when somebody says that the government, you know, wants to ban something, my immediate knee jerk response to something like that is no, absolutely not. Hell no. Tell the government to screw off. But I think that it's an interesting question here because we're talking about something where where there is an actual sincere national security question. The problem, of course, is that, you know, if it's, you know, knowing that it, it is true that uh, companies that operate within China or Chinese companies are required to turn, turn over data to the Chinese Communist Party, the problem is, is that if you could ban TikTok on those grounds, you can ban pretty much any Chinese company on those grounds. And America does a lot of business with China, a lot, a lot of business with China. I mean, how many of the products that you buy from Amazon or online or what have you uh, are made in China? How, many, how much of your clothes are made in China? So the problem is, is that with TikTok, you uh, are in a scenario where you kind of, you're in the same kind of a scenario with a lot of other uh, companies with you know doing business with Chinese companies. So in you know, and one of the things that we learned during the pandemic too is that you know if you you know we, a lot of our uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing being done in China is an actual national security risk to the United States. I think India was third behind China, and you know probably would be wiser to move some of our pharmaceutical manufacturing more of it over to India than rather than China because you know India is an actual ally of ours. But when it comes to um, the question of banning TikTok, you know there are, there are other questions right. There are societal harm questions in this one that I uh, that I think probably should not be considered because one of the price uh, the problems of, of freedom is that it allows people to do, you know to engage in harmful activities right behaviors. How can I say that I think you know adults should be able to engage in you know illicit drug use and then not you know think that they should you know destroy their lives by watching you know booby streamers on TikTok or whatever what have you. So the problem is, is that it, there is a national security question here. You know, China can use this data against us. It, it, is there something about TikTok? And this is the question, and I don't know the answer to. Maybe you know it. But is there something special about TikTok that makes it an exception for why it should be singled out to be banned when so many other Chinese companies have uh, these same kinds of issues. And, and also, we have to ask ourselves, what would be the economic consequences of banning TikTok? I mean, think about all the young people who are being, you know, their entire lives, their, their lifestyles would be upended. You pull the rug out from underneath all these people. You got to think about that kind of stuff. I know you probably don't care, some of you, because, you know, you make your money in, you know, the old market economy. But... I make my money in the new market economy. You start banning digital apps and things like that, and you know, you're coming after people like me, right? You're you're going after my ability to make a living, right? So I think it's kind of dangerous. My instinct is to say no, but there probably is an argument on national security grounds that something needs to be done to be changed about how our data is collected and given away to our enemies. You know what? I know who to ask this question. Judge Napolitano. He's coming up next. We'll ask him about that. What do you think? He's going to know way better than me. He's 10 times smarter than I am, even though he says that I am the right side of his brain. We'll talk about all that and more when we get back on the Wake Up America show at wakeupamericashow.com. Hello, my name is Kelvin. Welcome to Frenchy Bush. This is my Didi's website. Now I've decided to speak to you with my real voice for the first time ever to tell you about how cool Frenchy Bush is. But I've decided that this is the perfect opportunity to share with you. Frenchy Bush is a good website. You should follow us on socials. If you like Frenchies or any kind of bulldogs, me and my new brother Joe George are going to try to make your life more fun. Hello, I'm George. My neck isn't really thick yet, but it will be. We are so glad you're here. Please ignore my floating eyeball. It helps me spot predators who might be approaching from the sides. Dee Dee made Fringy Bullshit to review things that he uses on me and my brother to tell you if it's good or bullshit. Take this collar, for example. Dee Dee really likes it. Dee Dee said it's really handy because us Fringies got thick necks. Need something really tough. People People think Frenchies are little, but if you look at us from below, you can see we are really pretty buff. Mmm, beefcake. Yes. Look at my creamy thighs and chest. Yes. You like that? Big brother, please focus. Frenchie Bulls. Please follow us for more great content and read the Frenchie Bulls blog for more fun and cool stuff.
public defender. I am a public defender. I'm proud to be a public defender. 80% of Americans accused of a crime will get appointed a public defender. Everybody from a speeding ticket to capital murder. For every dollar we spend on public defenders, we spend $3 on prosecutors. Public defenders have to do pretty much everything on their own. Social workers, counselors. Investigating is another piece of it. The average public defender holds 300 cases annually. You never feel like there's enough time. Public defenders have health issues all the time. A lot of people give up and say, I can't do this work anymore. Gideon's Promise trains, mentors, and supports public defenders. There are a lot of people who say that they would not still be public defenders, but for Gideon's Promise. It's fueled me to continue on in this fight. Gideon's Promise has changed the face of public defense. People see us as troublemakers. <laughs> Good trouble only. We don't make it easy. It should not be easy to take away someone's liberty. Ever hear the one about the frog? Put a frog in a pot of boiling water and it'll jump right out. Here's my resume again. But put a frog in a pot of cool water and slowly heat it up and that frog will boil. It's a lie. But as a metaphor for us and all that we go through as veterans, you have any real world experience. It's a story that rings true. We make excuses for how we feel. We push everything down. We tell ourselves the lie that it's easier to stay in that boiling water. To disconnect. And some days, maybe, it is. But you've never been interested in easy. Make no mistake, reaching out is hard. Do it anyway. I need help. You're not alone. You've got this. You are not a frog. Find resources at va.gov slash reach. During last Friday's afternoon news dump, it was announced that President Joe Biden's administration had extended the COVID-19 national emergency, despite the president's recent declaration that, quote, the pandemic is over. This national emergency was first declared by President Donald Trump in January 2020 and has been renewed every 90 days since. This makes the 40th ongoing national emergency, and the oldest one of these is related to the 1979 Iran hostage crisis. When the president declares a national emergency, it grants him broad authority to respond to that emergency, such as things like managing means of production, in this case, vaccines and N95 mask manufacturing, as well as other things like sending military troops abroad and other extreme actions like instituting martial law, controlling transportation, and even communication. If you'll remember, President Trump stirred a controversy over this in recent years when he used his emergency powers to redirect billions of taxpayer dollars to help build the wall at the southern border after Congress declined his request to include the money in a government funding bill. The federal government has confirmed a nationwide shortage of Adderall, months after nearly two-thirds of community pharmacies reported that they were having trouble filling prescriptions. And despite this shortage, the federal government also indicates that it will not raise the drug's production quota for next year. In case you didn't already know, Adderall is a federally controlled substance because of its potential for abuse, and patients in most states can only pick up one month's supply at a time, and generally can only do so a few days before their previous prescription runs out. In response to the current shortage, the Food and Drug Administration has recommended that patients speak with their
their providers about finding alternative methods for treatment. The Drug Enforcement Agency, more commonly referred to as the DEA, every year sets up a production quota for Adderall to establish the quantities made for medical, scientific, and industrial use. Prescriptions for Adderall last year were up 10.4% compared to 2020. Between then and now, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, officials had relaxed federal rules that had required traditional in-person examinations before the prescription of addictive drugs like Adderall and Xanax. And in response to these rule changes, there was a boom in telehealth startup apps that were designed to streamline this relationship between remote providers and their patients. One of these popular telehealth apps known as Cerebral Inc. is now under federal investigation for deceptive and unfair advertising and marketing practices after the Federal Trade Commission announced that it was stepping up enforcement against companies that, quote, trick or trap consumers into subscription services. Good morning, Rise and Freedom. It's Austin Peterson. You're watching and listening to the Wake Up America Show at wakeupamericashow.com. All right, it's time to put on your thinking caps. It's big brain time. You know we've got the biggest brains that there are on this show. Only the biggest. The biggest in the world. Probably the biggest influence on my brain. His name's Judge Andrew Napolitano. He's a good friend of mine in the show. He's the host of the Judging Freedom podcast, which you can download on all of your mobile devices and you can also read his weekly column at judgenap.com he's joining us right now the man the myth the legend for joining us on the program today glad to see you here oh, good morning uh, thank you austin it's always a pleasure your introductions just keep getting better each week <laughs> <laughs> i learned from the best judge glad to have you here and uh, glad to have uh, you on this topic uh now judge i like to play devil's advocate sometimes because i think that makes for a, a far more interesting interview so if you hear any like statist inclinations from me today uh it's not really the real ap it's just trying to um you know just trying to get the best of, out of you and most libertarian i can um, people have been arguing Understood. for the, yeah, people have been arguing to ban TikTok for quite some time on national security grounds. In fact, uh, one of the chairs of the federal communications, uh, division, the FCC, uh, came out in a statement this last Tuesday saying that the, he doesn't see any way around us being able to regulate TikTok effectively without them still being required to turn over important, critical private information to our enemies in the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, Judge, do you think that there is an argument for on national security grounds for banning TikTok? No, I don't think there's an argument on national security grounds for banning TikTok. Uh, I, and as far as I know, everybody that uses TikTok does so voluntarily. And so they are presumed to, to know what they're getting involved with. And the government should have no say. Who, who is the government protecting us from? Ourselves, our own voluntary choices? The government should stay out of these businesses, out of the business of trying to protect us from ourselves. I can't imagine what the national security implications would be of my using TikTok or my neighbors using TikTok or you uh, using TikTok. And the last time I checked, we were pretty significant trading partners with the Chinese and not at war with their government. Now, Judge, the argument that's being made by people who are in favor of banning TikTok is that, and this is information that was just revealed a few weeks ago, is that it was created primarily to spy on American citizens. You know, if, if that is the case, if the Chinese government, you know, is using this application to spy on American citizens, you know, isn't it the role, the job of our government to protect us from foreign interference or from foreign spies? Well, if we invite the spies into our homes by connecting with them on the on our laptops and our mobile devices. This is a voluntary choice of Americans to do this. What do the Chinese gain by spying on you or me? We're not in the government. We're, we're not officials of the government who control the machinery uh, of government. This is just another effort by the government to uh, e e either exercise its power or divert our attention uh, from the true problems in America, which is government that is too big, too fat, takes too much wealth, and saps too much liberty. 
Judge, then would there be an argument perhaps if you were you know, the president of the United States or perhaps an official in the executive branch to at least ban government employees from using TikTok in order to prevent the foreign government from being able to have access to officials of the government, you know, like uh, as an executive order, for example? Well, I'm, I'm not a fan of government secrets, uh, but if, for example, Merrick Garland were drafting an indictment of Donald Trump, I, I think he wouldn't want the Chinese government to have access to that draft. If he were, this is all hypothetical, if he were foolish enough <clears throat> to be on TikTok or to give TikTok access by some means, I'm not a technological guy, but it, uh, to give uh, TikTok access to his work papers, uh, that would be reprehensible of him to do that. Uh, I'm not sure that an executive order from the president would accomplish anything because these are individual choices uh, by individuals. As far as I know, government officials are not permitted to use their government laptops and and mobile devices uh, on on social media. They have to do that on their own. Uh, they're using their own equipment. I think this is a stretch and I think it's efforts by government, the American government, to inveigle its way into our own personal private choices. If you're just tuning in, we're speaking to Judge Andrew Napolitano. He's the host of the Judging Freedom podcast, and he is also a columnist. You can read his weekly column at judgenap.com. Judge, you sent me an article did yesterday. Did you think that I would make it did you think or fear that I would be making the opposite arguments? No, 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 of course not, Judge. I bring you on specifically to make those arguments. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> no, Judge, I bring you on here so that you can convince people of the rightness of those uh, of those views. And uh, I like to set up a nice status straw man for you to knock over. But um, <laughs> Judge, I, I hope I knocked him over. <laughs> very well, sir. Very well. Uh, Judge, you sent me an article yesterday uh, about um, our Missouri Attorney General, Eric Schmidt, who's running for the U.S. Senate here in Missouri. He'll be, his name will be on the ballot in our upcoming midterms this next week um, about how uh, Eric Schmidt is um, seeking information about the Department of Homeland Security colluding with big tech. Now, Judge, um, when it comes to, you know, policing TikTok, you don't, you know, it's all voluntary. You probably feel the same way about big tech here in the United States with the caveat that, you know, if the government is colluding with big tech here in the United States, then you have a problem with it. Can you explain your point of view on this topic? Well, well, yes, I do have a problem with it. If big tech is doing the government's bidding, if big tech censors Donald Trump or Alex Jones or Austin Peterson uh, uh, because the government has asked them to do so, then the, the government and big tech are involved in a symbiotic relationship. The government continues to um, protect big tech from liability for the consequences of what it's is posted on their bulletin boards, and big tech is doing the censoring for the government. The government cannot censor speech because of its content. The First Amendment prevents it from doing that. The government can stop you from giving a speech in the middle of, of, a, of a courtroom. It can stop you from using a, a bullhorn at three o'clock in the morning in a residential neighborhood neighborhood, that time, place, and manner regulation, as long as there are other ample, adequate, comparable venues for you to express speech. But the government can't suppress your speech because of its content. But if the government has someone else suppress your speech because the government doesn't like its content, then that someone else derives the same uh, First Amendment restraints that the government has. So if the government and I'll just use this as an example of Facebook, if the government and Facebook are in a symbiotic relationship, uh, the government is protecting Facebook from liability for the consequences of what people post. Facebook is suppressing speech that the government hates. Then Facebook is required to comply with the First Amendment as if it were the government. That's called state action. That's the name of the theory a symbiotic relationship between a private actor and a public one. And that would prevent Facebook from suppressing speech because of its content, and it would expose Facebook to liability for the consequences of interfering with speech because of its, con its content. 
just as the government can be sued if it interferes with speech because of its content. Um, I have not followed the, the race in uh, Missouri. I don't always vote for Republicans. I couldn't imagine voting for Josh Hawley, and I don't know who's running against the Missouri Attorney General. So with all those caveats, he did expose in connection with litigation he and other state attorneys general have brought against DHS and big tech, a monumental, unbelievable relationship between big tech and the government, which the public needs to know about and which will be very costly for government and big tech if it can be proven. They have, they have emails. I mean, there may be other emails that contradict these, but what they revealed two or three days ago, and again, it might've been revealed to time it with the midterms, I don't know, but just looking objectively at what they revealed a few days ago, it shows an effort on the part of the government to have this relationship, whether the relationship was actually consummated or not remains to be seen. Uh, we're speaking to Judge Andrew Napolitano, the host of the Judging Freedom podcast right now, if you're just tuning in. Uh, Judge, you wrote a column that's uh, being published at judgenap.com about the Supreme Court hearing oral arguments in regards to a lawsuit against Harvard uh, in regards to how they use racial quotas for uh, admissions in students. Uh, in your column, you talk about that, you know, the, the ideal, which is that Harvard would receive no federal funds and that they would be allowed to do as they please, you know, have race-based quotas if they desire. But it's likely that this, the Supreme Court, knowing that you know federal funds are being used, could potentially overturn race-based admissions. What are your thoughts on this case, and what do you expect the outcome to be? Well, the 14th Amendment uh, was written largely to prevent the government from using race as a basis for a decision, using race as one of the uh, tools in its toolbox uh, of governance. It was not written uh, to prevent private people from doing so. And to the extent that the Civil Rights of Act of 64 in, intrudes upon private property under a commerce clause theory, that because you drove from one state to another, the motel in the second state has to uh, give you a room if they have one available because the lettuce that you eat was grown in another state, the seller of the lettuce is subject to the federal civil rights laws. These are absurd uh, principles of law and violations uh, of the constitution. Harvard is richer than the federal government. I'm taking into account the government's 31 or $32 trillion debt. Doesn't need money from the feds. Even if it were poor, the feds have no business distributing tax dollars or money borrowed in the taxpayer's name for educational purposes because it's not authorized uh, under the constitution. So Harvard shouldn't get a nickel from the feds. And on the other hand, Harvard is a private entity. It can do what it wants on its property. It can decide to use racial quotas. The University of North Carolina, also a defendant in this case, is a public school. It is owned by the state of North Carolina, which is regulated by the 14th Amendment, <clears throat> excuse me, Amendment. So the University of North Carolina cannot use racial quotas. The Justice Department, as it always does, jumped in on this case. And shockingly, it is on the side of the libertarian students and the libertarian professors who are challenging Harvard and challenging North Carolina. But an interesting uh, conversation took place during the oral argument uh, the other day. And my hat is off to uh, Justice Katanji Brown Jackson, with whom I disagree on many things other than her personality, which is charming and, and gracious and fearless. And the Solicitor General, the government's lawyer in the courtroom, had just finished attacking Harvard and North Carolina for making decisions based on race when Justice Brown said, what about West Point? Well, what about West Point? Okay, the federal government owns four universities, West Point, Annapolis, the Air Force Academy, and the um, Coast Guard Academy, they use racial quotas in their admission. So how bad can this be? The Solicitor General, well, that's for national security purposes. The court roared, even the liberals on the court. What conceivable national security purpose is there? This is the government's favorite justification for everything it does, for racial quotas at the military academies. None. Judge, on the um, other hand, it's very, it's very clear from listening to justices 
uh, Gorsuch and, and Alito which way the court is going to go on this. They are going to reverse the crazy Sandra Day O'Connor opinion from 22 years ago, which said that the societal goal of a diverse freshman class at all state colleges and colleges that receive federal funds, which is every college in the country but 12, trumps, lowercase t, the 14th Amendment. That's hogwash, and the Supreme Court will finally correct that. Judge, uh, setting aside your legal hat for just a moment, which I know is tough, we call you judge, but uh, do you have a personal view on affirmative action and the desire by liberals to mandate diversity in our educational system as well as in other aspects of society? Yes, I do, and I condemn it because uh, people should uh, achieve their goals in this world on the basis of their uh, personal work ethic and the talents the good Lord gave them and their used to their ability to develop and use those talents, not because of some government mandate. Now, I'm assuming by affirmative action, you're talking about the government command of affirmative action. You're not talking about somebody doing somebody else a favor. Look, I want a full scholarship to Princeton. For all I know, this is 50 years later, Austin, I just went to my 50th reunion. For all I know, it was because of the Italian-American quota. Sam Alito, my classmate, also won, a, also from New Jersey, also Italian-American, also won a full scholarship to Princeton. I don't know how or why we got these scholarships. I don't think the government had anything to do with it. We never signed any papers uh, reflecting any uh, government involvement. If it was some voluntary decision by Princeton to give me a leg up because they wanted more Italian Americans there, I can understand that. Uh, and it's acceptable. It's a voluntary choice by the owner of the property as to how he wants to use it. But if it's a government command psh, in education, where's that in the Constitution? It's uh, quite fascinating. Judge Andrew Napolitano, your weekly column comes out uh, at judgenap.com, and you also are the host of the Judging Freedom podcast. Judge, is there anything else that you think that my listeners should know this week before I let you go? Uh, no, I mean, I think we we always manage to uh, to discuss these, these hot button issues. Yesterday, I was on with Alex Jones uh, for an hour. Uh, he mentioned uh, Tim Pool. Uh, we talked extensively about the uh, documents the Missouri Attorney General has uh, on Earth, and we talked extensively about the freedom of speech uh, and how there's an Alex Jones rule in uh, Connecticut that everybody so, who is in the business of uh, affecting public opinion, like you and me, needs to be aware of. If a judge doesn't like your opinion, she or he will declare it to be a non-opinion and then say it doesn't uh, have and enjoy constitutional protection. I, I predicted, and it's an easy prediction that the Supreme Court will reverse this, but not after Alex uh, will have spent tens of millions in uh, legal fees fighting these people. Judge, uh, from a political viewpoint, this is, um, you know, massive, big brain, you know, major philosophical questions here on a, from a political viewpoint. You know, when we, you and I started working together back in 2010, officially at Fox Business Network, you know, uh, our initial program that we produced there was the Tea Party Summit. Uh, it was the rise of politicians like Justin Amash, Thomas Massey, uh, Congressman Ron Paul came into uh, uh, national popularity. Senator Rand Paul was elected. You know, we, we had, you know, Governor of Alaska, Sarah Palin, sitting across from you, endorsing uh, ending the Federal Reserve System. You know, the liberty movement was very, it was very much at its height. Um, but since then, it appears that, you know, the, the power has shifted away from the liberty movement towards a new, more populist movement here. Many libertarians are endorsing and supporting this populist movement. Uh, Congressman Ron Paul actually endorsed the you know populist candidate in Arizona, Blake Masters, who's running against Mark Kelly, um, in, in leading some to believe that you know the Pat Buchanans of the Republican Party have very much have common cause with libertarians, and you know that has a lot to do with the fact that you know the Pat Buchanans and the the paleo conservatives. Uh, have agreed with libertarians on foreign policy. You know, they have a very much a, an America first view when it comes to foreign policy that jives very much with, you know, non-intervention, as you and I believe in terms of the role of the American military in foreign affairs. You, you and I are Jeffersonians. I'm using a lot of big words here, but I'm building up to something. 
Because I'm very curious, Judge, how you feel about this new populist movement, noting that it has roots in not just Pat Buchanan, but in the paleo strategy of Murray Rothbard and others in his late, late years in life. You know, many people like Ron Paul and others find common cause with this with these paleo conservatives, despite the fact that they disagree with us on things like fiscal conservatism, and they're, they're the type of social conservatives that disagree with our views on things like, you know, uh, gay marriage or or what have you or you know transgender people and and their ability to conduct you know their affairs in society so i i wonder do you do you sort of track along with the idea that we have common cause with this you know populist or paleo conservative movement because of these agreements with um with with them on foreign policy and other uh, affairs or, or do you think that you know we should stand on our own um you know distinct and separate because of the the important distinctions between these groups the roots uh, of these groups is not Murray Rothbard, it's Theodore Roosevelt, uh, one of the worst presidents in American history, one of the true perverters of the Constitution, trying to outdo his nemeses, Woodrow Wilson and uh, William McKinley, the progressive era personified uh, by the so-called Republican uh, Roosevelt was one of the most damaging in American history and it continues to damage us today. So I profoundly disagree with our uh, libertarian colleagues who have moved in this direction and have debated loud and long with them to the point where I'm really kind of tired of uh, doing it. I mean, libertarians who support Donald Trump or big government Republicans or Republicans who wanna tell us how to live from their version, Josh Crawley is a perfect, perfect, paradigmatic example of this. Uh, these people are not libertarians. They are uh, Democrats calling themselves Republicans because they believe in the power of government to tell you how to live. And they believe that government is presumed to be moral and correct because government is the negation of liberty, Mary Rothbard. Government, <laughs> although it's actually a phrase from uh, von Mises, but Rothbard used it many, many times. Uh, government is presumed to be immoral and presumed to be wrong. Everything government has it is stolen. Everything the government has it has taken. It doesn't ex exist for our benefit. It exists for its own benefit to expand its power and to regulate us. And this variant of uh, Pat Buchanan and Blake Masters, I can't use Ron Paul's name in the same uh, breath, but this variant uh, a Republican is nefarious and dangerous and needs to be exposed for what it truly is. So then, Judge, you must have been deeply concerned then in, in the late 1990s when Murray Rothbard endorsed Pat Buchanan and endorsed what we call the paleo cons conservative strategy. I mean, you know, he wrote extensively about, you know, getting, you know, the rednecks, you know, involved in the liberty movement because we shared common cause with them to a certain extent. So, so you know, I, I don't know how you felt at the time or if you were paying attention at the time, but you must have been aware, you know, of the paleo strategy of, you know, the Rockwellians and the and the Rothbardians. So to to your mind, that was a departure from libertarianism. Is that correct? So even though some of the names are the gold standard uh, in libertarian thinking, like Murray Rothbard and Lou Rockwell, yes, it was a, a departure. And there was a dramatic uh, departure when uh, Trump ran against Hillary and people like Walter Block, who's the most libertarian human being on the planet, uh, you know, started some group called Academics for Libertarian Academics for Trump. And he had 4,000 uh, signatures. What libertarian in their right mind could vote for an authoritarian? Mm. Uh, but uh, many of them did. I think they were deeply disappointed uh, in his presidency because of uh, all the issues that were brought on, mainly by his personality. Um, uh, nevertheless, people who believe in government cannot be considered libertarians and cannot be defenders of personal liberty. Now, I recognize that an election is a choice. You have a choice between Hillary uh, and Trump. You have a choice between Biden and Trump. There's always a lesser party candidate running. If it's Ron Paul, uh, you, you vote for him with glee. If it's some libertarian you never heard of, you just sort of check the box uh, and move on. But to support publicly the idea that the government can tell us how to live is antithetical to the view that the individual is sovereign rather than the state. 
These are the conversations that you will not get on any other show, perhaps save Judging Freedom. The judges podcast themselves at judgenap.com. Judge, thank you for your point of view. Thank you for sharing your uh, heart with us. We appreciate you very much. All the best, Austin. Talk to you soon. You as well. Do you like Judge Napolitano? Send us a text, 573-319-1586. My next guest, Noah Rothman. You haven't heard from him before. He's going to talk about the death of liberal comedy, the rise of conservative comedy. All that and more on the Wake Up America show at wakeupamericashow.com. Hello, my name is Kelvin. Welcome to Frenchy Bush. This is my Didi's website, and I've decided to speak to you with my real voice for the first time ever to tell you about how cool Frenchy Bush is, but I've decided that this is the perfect opportunity to share with you. Frenchy Bush is a good website. You should follow us on socials. If you like Frenchies or any kind of bulldogs, me and my new brother George are going to try to make your life more fun. Hello, I'm George. My neck isn't really thick yet, but it will be. We are so glad you're here. Please ignore my floating eyeball. It helps me spot predators who might be approaching from the sides. Dee Dee made Frenchy Bush to review things that he used on me and my brother to tell you if it's good or bullshit. Take this collar, for example. Didi really likes it. Didi said it's really handy because us Frenchies got thick necks. Need something really tough. People think Frenchies are little, but if you look at us from below, you can see we are really pretty buff. Mmm, beefcake. Yes. Look at my creamy thighs and chest. Yes. You like that? Big brother, please focus. Frenchy bullshit. Please follow us for more great content. And read the Frenchy Bulls blog for more fun and cool stuff. I'm a public defender. I am a public defender. I'm proud to be a public defender. 80% of Americans accused of a crime will get appointed a public defender. Everybody from a speeding ticket to capital murder. For every dollar we spend on public defenders, we spend $3 on prosecutors. Public defenders have to do pretty much everything on their own. Social workers, counselors. Investigating is another piece of it. The average public defender holds 300 cases annually. You never feel like there's enough time. Public defenders have health issues all the time. A lot of people People give up and say, I can't do this work anymore. Gideon's Promise trains, mentors, and supports public defenders. There are a lot of people who say that they would not still be public defenders, but for Gideon's Promise. It's fueled me to continue on in this fight. Gideon's Promise has changed the face of public defense. People see us as troublemakers. <laughs> Good trouble only. We don't make it easy. It should not be easy to take away someone's liberty. Ever hear the one about the frog? Put a frog in a pot of boiling water and it'll jump right out. Here's my resume again. But put a frog in a pot of cool water and slowly heat it up and that frog will boil. It's a lie. But as a metaphor for us and all that we go through as veterans, you have any real world experience. It's a story that rings true. We make excuses for how we feel. We push everything down. We tell ourselves the lie that it's easier to stay in that boiling water. To disconnect. And some days, maybe, it is. But you've never been interested in easy. Make no mistake, reaching out is hard. Do it anyway. You're not alone. You've got this. You are not a frog. Find resources at va.gov slash reach.
Good morning. It's 834. You're watching and listening to the Wake Up America show with Austin Peterson. It's time to rise in freedom. Have you ever noticed how unfunny Jimmy Kimmel, Stephen Colbert, and all these other liberal late night hosts have become? Oh, you haven't noticed. Well, it's probably because you're not watching them. Like a lot of people who aren't watching them. You're probably watching Greg Gutfeld. Back when he was in Red Eye Days, nobody used to watch him. Now he's got two million viewers. It's the rise of right-wing comedy. Joining me now to discuss is a man who's chronicled the rise in his new book and his latest column on Commentary Magazine, where he's an associate editor. His name is Noah Rothman. This is his first time on the program, and he's joining us now live on camera. Good morning, Noah. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Nice to meet you. Morning. Nice to meet you, too. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, thanks so much for coming on. So one of the things that I was reading in your column, uh, That's Not Funny, on commentary.org, is how the left is triggered by this rise of right-wing comedy. Now, is that is it just that, that right-wing comedy is becoming more popular, or is it that left-wing comedy or late-night shows are becoming less popular? What's happening here with the culture? Yeah, I certainly think it's a misnomer to call it right-wing comedy, because it's not like we're talking about conservatism. We're not talking about, uh, you know, monetarist economic policies or extroverted foreign policies or even, you know, criminal justice and, uh, you know, traditionally what you would call politics. Uh, the thematics are right wing only in so far as the left has abandoned what we would traditionally consider a comedic outlook, flippancy, irreverence, uh, self-deprecation, a lack of self-seriousness uh, foremost among them. Uh, what the left has confused with right wing comedy is really just what comedy is, uh, a certain degree of, uh, of f certainly flippancy and um, what George Carlin, what they what the left believes themselves to be uh, punching at the right targets. You, what George Carlin said back in the day was, uh, you know, a, a true comedian, a true satirist punches up, finds powerful targets, speaks truth to power. Uh, and is dismissive and disregards the kind of preening, scolding moralism that was conventionally a feature of the right. Uh, the rules have have the roles rather have reversed significantly over the years. The left now considers itself very serious. Uh, where and this the this piece was occasioned by a New York Times op-ed, which demonstrates why left-wing comedy has become so uh, sanctimonious and therefore not funny. Uh, because the audiences they're trying to appeal to don't want to be entertained. This woman talks at length about how scared she is, how desperate these times are, how corrupt our politics are, and how, quote, large swaths of the Republican Party have embraced ident white identitarian politics. We're too scared to laugh. Well, guess what? If you're too scared to laugh, comedians are not going to be playing to you. You're not the audience. The audience has become the right, and the right has become more receptive to jokes and humor. Because it's not, it doesn't undermine the great mission of our time, the great work of our time, promoting the progressive project. And anything that goes against that is worse than worthless. It is dangerous. This is fascinating stuff. We're speaking to Noah Rothman. If you're just tuning in, he is the author of a new book called The Rise of the New Puritans, Fighting Against the Progressives' War on Fun. Now, when I was a young man, I grew up in the 1980s. You know, when I thought of Puritans, I thought of the Jerry Falwells, the moral majorities, the people who were telling me I was going to go to hell if I was playing Dungeons and Dragons and casting spells and things like that. But that's, right. that's, that's changed quite a bit. What, what do you, to what do you attribute this change? I mean, why is it that all of a sudden Republicans got a sense of humor? I guess right-wingers got a sense of humor. And you say that comedy isn't really, you know, political in a sense, but it, it does seem that comedy is overtly political to the left. When I turn on Jimmy Kimmel or when I, if, when, you know, the very few occasions I'll catch Stephen Colbert or, you know, Seth Meyers or whatever, it's all about politics to them. Right. Um, so one of the, the people that I spoke with for my latest book, uh, The Rise of the New Puritans, was the late uh, humorist P.J. O'Rourke, who defines humor as essentially two planes of meeting, uh, two planes of meaning meeting at an unexpected angle. Uh, in, in some, you're surprised by uh, a punchline. You you have you can't see it coming or the laugh is not genuine. It's forced. Uh, and for so much of the late night programs, for example, and what we understand to be progressive comedy, which is on the decline, uh, quite a lot of these chat shows find themselves on the chopping block where their hosts are just seeding the field. Um, it's not there's nothing unexpected about it. You know exactly what you're getting. You know what you tune in for as a progressive therapy session for anxious liberals. And you get what you pay for, which is, uh, you know, the the kind of satire of the right targets that contributes to the great mission of our time, advancing the progressive project. How did this happen? So in the book, I, I identify sort of a 
a change in ethos, particularly on on the right. The right has abandoned quite a lot of the conventional culture wars that it was inclined to wage uh, in the moral majoritarian age when when we grew up. Divorce, even abortion to a certain degree, gay marriage. A lot of these are very settled issues. The right now is more inclined to prosecute what I call uh, pop culture wars, sort of the stuff that pops up online and and is very ephemeral. Um, but the left has re-embraced a moralism that their forebearers would not recognize. And I think that this is a part and a feature of the way in which the left has become to identify less with liberalism, classical or otherwise, and more with progressivism. They have adopted its mental gestures. Among them, a hatred of idleness, an anxiety over the, the prevalence of wickedness and even banal pastimes that only they can see with their keen senses of propriety. An ameliorous tendency towards utopianism, the idea that we can perfect the world. And if the world can be perfected, we have a moral obligation to engage in that process. And part of this, the, the remoralization of the left isn't entirely bad, as I discuss in this book, but a lot of the manifestations of it are quite silly and, and sap life of its joy. You, I, when it comes to entertainment and comedy, you hear comedians increasingly emphasize the pain that someone had to endure so that you could enjoy something as frivolous and trite as a punchline. That entertainment companies need to impose didactic narratives in their media products because the entertainment has to serve a higher social purpose than just entertainment. Sports coverage has to shoehorn digressions about the state of race relations into the coverage of a game. And when fans object, as they often do, they're admonished for wanting um, explicitly wanting escapism to preserve their escapism over their moral duty to dwell on the misery of existence at all times and in all things. This is explicitly puritanical. And Puritanism was the uh, progressivism rose from the ashes of the Puritan experiment in New England in, in the heart of mainline Protestantism. They are really re getting back in touch with their intellectual roots. Mm, good stuff. Uh, if you're just tuning in, we're speaking to Noah Rothman. He's an associate editor at Commentary Magazine. We're talking about the the rise of conservative comedy and the fall of left wing comedy uh, to some extent. Uh, Noah, in your uh, article here on Commentary, you say that today's progressives are not orchestrating a rebellion, but trying to put one down. Can you expand on that? That's exactly right. Um, so in the George Carlin formulation, punching up meant going after the preening moralist scolds who occupied politics, but also the commanding heights of corporate America. Um, the left really did have a conception of itself as an insurgency mounting this, uh, you know, a bold assault on the citadels of conformity. That's no longer the case. Entertainment co uh, companies cater to their needs. Universities do. Corporations do. Politicians certainly flatter their pretensions. Um, they're no longer you know, the the um, plucky band of insurgents going after, you know, the Death Star here, they're mounting a rearguard action against the very same forces of insurgency that they think themselves to be. A lot of the people who I talked with, most of the people I talked with for this book, and I would venture most of the people who do uh, entertainment and comedy for a living, don't think of themselves as conservative politically. I don't think they would vote that way. What they are are entertainers. What they're after is the laugh. It doesn't matter whether that advances a particular political mission one way or the other. The job is to entertain for the sake of entertainment. And it's the left that has turned against that very mission because anything that serves so trite and valueless a purpose as merely making you smile uh, is uh, it abdicates our duty to some degree to uh, contribute to the betterment of society. And you see this everywhere. You see it in food and food culture. I see it in entertainment, as we talked about comedy, but also in sex, in the consumption of alcohol, in family life, and how we orchestrate and organize society, um, and sports and fashion. It is everywhere because all things, all of society's engines must be directed in one particular direction. And it's a moral duty, a moral responsibility. And if you don't feel that moral pang, or you're immune to the to the social pressures that are imposed on you by your, your co-partisans on the left, um, then you buck those trends and you can seem and appear conservative to people who are absolutely consumed with the idea that all facets of society must have some sort of a progressive ethos that is not like implicit, explicit. It has to be obvious and intentional and deliberate because like, there's an element of condescension here. You can't be trusted with nuance. You have to be bludgeoned over the head with whatever the narrative is that they want you to, to accept. 
Um, so these people aren't conservative, I would say. I think most of them don't identify as conservative. What they are are fun and funny <laughs> and interesting and witty. And that is not what the progressive left wants to reward. That's fascinating. I I think that that might explain a little bit about why the left is so triggered by someone like Elon Musk, who, you know, in political matters, you know, shares common cause with them. You know, Elon Musk supported, you know, Andrew Yang for, uh, you know, his presidential campaign and has come out in favor of things like a universal basic income and, you know, many other progressive views. But it to me, I think that it's the his ability to have fun and his ability to have to make jokes is why the left despises him so much. And, you know, you see this moral outrage from people like Rob Ryan. Reiner and you know many other blue check marks on Twitter at people like Elon Musk and and Joe Rogan who who would otherwise be good progressives if it weren't for the fact that the that the left has become such you know the nattering nabobs of negativity if you will right they are the uh, right. you know the, they are the moral scolds if you will it, it, it's kind of become a fascinating transition to watch them go but I, you know it's probably you know a natural result of get it gaining power is that once a you know a sort of a faction gains power then like you say it it becomes Becomes all about suppressing rebellions rather than becoming the rebellions. And I think there's something about Americans and Americanism that we really tend to side for the underdog or the rebellions or the, you know, the bad kids or the kids who are out there, you know, who are causing trouble and, and you know, engaging in, you know, the sort of the capitalistic, you know, you know, destruction of, you know, regimes and elites as they are. And, and so that's why the left has sort of abandoned their, you know, their roots in, in, in art and in culture. And, and th th like you say, they desire to sort of bash people over the heads with their views. You can't be trusted with nuance. You have to go when you watch a superhero movie or you watch She-Hulk, you know, some series, you know, you have to have the feminism in, in, you know, in your face and they have to identify as feminists and do so in the script. Because we couldn't have gotten that by the fact that, you know, you're, you know, twerking, you know, She-Hulk, a lawyer, female, you know, superhero twerking. So I, I guess it is, you know, it, it's not just been the sort of the death of comedy to some extent, with, you know, that's led to the rise of this new comedy, but it's also been the death of, of art and culture in, in many other ways, right? Postmodernism sort of leads to this, you know, bland, gray, banal sort of culture where, you know, maybe everything's in high definition, but if you've noticed, most of what we watch is, you know, dull, gray, you know, most of the, the color grading that's being done on film and in television, you know, is just is just very dark. And, um, you know, it, it's it's not quite the sort of colorific 70s and 80s, you know, panoramic color, technicolor that we used to enjoy. You know, the left has really become, you know, very dark, very gray. And, and it's reflected, I believe, very much in the type of of art and film and television that we're seeing. Would you agree? Absolutely. That's a very astute. Dark and miserable because misery conveys to everyone around you sort of a sense of seriousness, sobriety, and seriousness of purpose. Um, even though it saps the joy out of life and makes everyone around you miserable, they think it conveys you know some sort of authority on their part. Uh, Musk is an interesting uh, figure in this because you know, he is um, he's not a conservative by any means. And of the three, you know, stool, uh, the three legged stool of progressive philosophy, environmentalism features rather prominently, along with um, racial rapprochement and uh, the redistribution of incomes equitably. Um, and Elon Musk has contributed significantly to environmental causes, popularizing the most popular in electric vehicle uh, in history. Uh, but he is despised by the left because he seems to be having a really good time doing it. Uh, he's not. He's not dour. He's not sour. He's not miserable. He's not apocalyptic about this thing. He's really enjoying himself and the affectation that he presents of this sort of bro-y, happy-go-lucky type of guy is really frustrating to a left that believes that that is that it lacks a seriousness of purpose that is unequal to the scale of the challenges that we're presented with today. Um, and you said another thing I thought was actually quite important because these the the power structure now is is on the left they don't really recognize it as such and i think there's an ang anxiety there a paranoia that all of these corporations and political figures and universities and entertainment companies and food producers and half a dozen other cultural figures that are kowtowing to their to their beliefs and particularly the identitarian sort of social justice uh dei philosophy that has taken over the country in the last 2 3 years is kind of fragile maybe not a very stable covenant. And so anything that threatens it has to be aggressively policed, which actually hastens, uh, amenitizes the uh, the dissolution of this social covenant that they want to preserve. Um, but they're 
genuinely just possessed of of fear. There, there's a lot of fear and a lot of anxiety, and um, it has led them into this emotional cul-de-sac where they're uh, constantly paranoid and anxious and, and need to be promoting their views at all times and at all things, and they don't trust you, and they think you're probably not uh, not as morally upright, just, not as morally upright and virtuous as they are. Uh, and so they end up being very heavy handed with it. And it only hastens this backlash that I talk about in this book. And that I, I think I identify a little bit in this column where people who are on the left, who've never voted Republican in their life, wouldn't if you put a gun to their heads, are now giving the right a second look because it's the only place where they can express themselves without fear of real reputational damage. You you close your column here on commentary by saying that progressives have ceded the genre to their political opponents in the misguided belief that the laugh is subversive. Highly recommend this. Noah Rothman is the associate editor of Commentary. And uh, Noah, is there anything else that you think that our listeners should know before I let you go? Uh, if you like this, there's a lot more in the book. The Rise of the New Puritans Fighting Back Against Progressives' War on Fun, available wherever uh, fine books are sold. You can uh, read me at Commentary Magazine or MSNBC, where I contribute twice a month. And my Twitter handle, if you want to read that, is Noah C. Rothman. Noah C. Rothman. It was a pleasure to meet you, Noah. This was great content. And we really appreciate it. We'll definitely be reading your column and getting your new book. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Austin. Take care. Thank you very much. Did you like Noah Rothman? Send us a text, 573-319-1586. Love to hear from you on that one. When we get back, Elon Musk says that he is not going to reinstate anybody just yet. But he is going to reinstate people. Oh, boy. It's going to be that right-wing cesspool soon. Can you imagine Alex Jones, Donald Trump back on Twitter? Even if you don't like Alex Jones or Donald Trump, don't you just appreciate a little bit of chaos? Just a little bit of fun? spontaneous chaos we're gonna have lots more fun before we go on the wake up america show at wakeupamericashow.com i was as a medic to be there to help my patients and after an injury i found myself as a patient i experienced post-traumatic seizures depression is a big one that comes along with it ptsd so i pursued my phd in neuroscience and regenerative medicine the coalition has helped fund my academic pursuits they genuinely care about helping the vet in whatever way that they can. Through supporting the coalition, you're supporting some of the veterans that have the biggest needs. Visit saluteheroes.org to learn more. If there wasn't going to be somebody who was a fiery champion of liberty, somebody who would who would get out there and who would be aggressive in it, if they wouldn't do it with more fire or passion than I had, then I would go and I would fight this battle for us. I've fought for the principles that we all share. Parties tend to be secondary to me. We're here because we believe in the principles of liberty. I am not a perfect messenger, but I think I'm a damn good one. This is a replica of our first president's flintlock pistol. You have my full support, my respect, and my gun. matter. Are lies to be encouraged instead of punished? This is not our inheritance. If truth no longer matters, we will not remain free for long. This is our generation's challenge, to defend our founders' hope that we the people could self-govern if we defend our right to get the facts. And right now, we're building the only defense a free people have, the facts on every politician, every position they held, every statement they've made, every vote they've made, and any cash they've taken. It's the real history on those now pandering for your vote. There are hundreds of young people building our defense right now, and they need your help. 
We all have our passions, but as our ancestors knew, when events become so foul they threaten us all, we must stand and defend each other. Please, have our backs. Join us at votesmart.org. What would happen if, if I had to pick up the phone, call 911 for one of my family members or one of my neighbors? What would I do if, if no one was on the other end to respond? What if there was no 911? So you can be a part of the solution. Anybody can be a firefighter, male, female, younger, older. We are school teachers. We are leaders in business. It's me, you, anyone that wants to be. There is no typical firefighter. We wish you a freedom Christmas. We wish you a freedom Christmas. We wish you a freedom Christmas and a Liberty New Year. Socialists and commies may try to convince you that the holiday is all about free stuff. But let's be honest, we all know whose wallet Santa's gifts are coming out of. There ain't no such thing as a free stocking. <laughs> Santa is the only guy with a big white beard promising free stuff that we want anything to do with this holiday. And if you don't believe, you don't receive. It's a capitalist, consumerist holiday, and it's time for a Santa-sized stimulus. Get your free market merch at the AP for Liberty shop today and stuff your socialist sister's stockings full of capitalist cheer. Ho, 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 ho. Good morning, Rise and Freedom. Austin Peterson here on the Wake Up America Show at wakeupamericashow.com. Did you like Noah Rothman? Boy, we're getting some great interviews on this show lately. Man, I just really feel like we're, like we're going places. How about you? You enjoying yourself? I appreciate all of our listeners texting in. Andy Opperman in this morning. I appreciate all of the support that we get from our listeners and viewers just like you. Rare Camellia, Tali Owens, quite the caricature. Glad to have you here this morning. They said, please don't remind me about She-Hulk twerking. Ha, <laughs> yeah, pretty bad stuff. Um, Elon Musk says that blocked Twitter users won't be allowed back until a process is in place. New Twitter owner says he's spoken to a number of civil society leaders about the company's policies. So the idea is, is that in order for people like Alex Jones or Donald Trump to be restored, um, they're going to have to go through a process of approving the people to come back. Mr. Musk, you know, recently took over the company and he is uh, going to have a content moderation council, he says, that's going to include representatives with widely divergent views. And it's going to include the civil rights community and groups who have faced hate-fueled violence. So, you know, that's plenty of room for lefties in there. Um, now, Musk has described himself as a free speech ad, uh, uh, absolutist, and he has to kind of you know, address concerns that the social media platform under his ownership, you know, being subject to looser content um, moderation and wel welcoming back some of these personalities who are removed from the platform aren't going to come into conflict with the advertising requirements of the campaign, right? Because, you know, there are two large advertising companies that have recommended this week that their clients hold off on advertising on Twitter because of concerns about the ability of the company to moderate its content. Now, Musk has said that, you know, he would welcome back Donald Trump. Um, and but, you know, that Twitter can't become what he calls a free for all hellscape or anything can be said with no consequences. He says Twitter must be warm and welcoming to all. And, and I understand this this concept here because, you know, it, what Trump or excuse me, what Musk has said is that he wants Twitter to operate in a similar way to the U.S. Constitution or the free speech guidelines of Twitter should be in line with the Constitution. If you can say it, you know, in public and if you can say it, on you know, in, in other fashion fashions and it's legal for you to say it, you should be able to say it on Twitter, which is pretty wide latitude, which would really just mean that the only thing that you couldn't say on Twitter is that I am going to kill this person at this such and such time and I'm going to do it this way in that manner, or you should kill that person.
person right now and you should do harm to that person or you should commit crimes, you know, um, right now in that way. If you spur people on, you know, that's that's been illegal for quite some time. And of course, threats made against the president and things of, of such matter are not protected under free speech. You know, maybe it should be, you think that's that's up to you. But uh, we're talking about what's currently in line with the Constitution as it is. Which means, you know, a hell of a lot, a hell of a lot of speech will be allowed, you know, more than would be allowed, you know, perhaps on the, any traditional radio station or on a, any traditional television station regulated by the FCC, if you will. So that means, you know, quite a bit. Um, now, how advertisers are going to impact the platform, that really remains to be seen. Because at the end of the day, there are going to be advertisers that probably are not going to be okay with advertising on a platform that allows Donald Trump on, right? There are going to be advertisers that are going to have ESG policies that are not going to be in line with a platform like Twitter. Now, Musk is going to have to make some kind of financial decisions in the future about how he's going to manage the platform and how he's going to protect free speech while still being able to monetize the platform. And that really is a challenge. Challenge because private companies who want to do business with Twitter, they have a choice if they want to do business with Twitter or not. And that's their right. As a, in a free society, if you don't want to advertise because you don't like the message, that's your right as a company. Which means that people like ourselves probably need to spend some advertising dollars on Twitter. Or maybe I'll have to pay that $8 a month to keep my blue check mark over there. What do you think? Should I do that? I saw Stephen King was all outraged about that, having to pay to keep that eight. I think that probably isn't going to happen. Maybe it will, even if it does. I don't know. Another great way to flex on the pores, if you will. <laughs> what do you think? Thank you so much for watching the Wake Up America show. All of our friends of the show, lots of great things. Exciting news coming very soon. Yes, that's right. Exciting news coming. Richard Bell, Tolly Owens, Nerd Bands for Liberty, Rare Camellia, my lovely wife, Stephanie Peterson, Chris Morrill, Tony Allegra and all of our friends over on the show. We're so grateful to have you. Thank you for being a friend of the show. Thank you for supporting us. We we'll love you very much. We'll see you tomorrow on the Wake Up America show at wakeupamericashow.com. as a medic to be there to help my patients and after an injury I found myself as a patient. I experienced post-traumatic seizures, depression is a big one that comes along with it, PTSD. So I pursued my PhD. shooting things, but whenever I can't shoot something, I like to cut things. My life isn't all about shooting and stabbing and cutting, though. Sometimes I have to do actual work, but when I work, I still like to have fun. And there's nothing less fun than trying to cut with a crappy knife. Thankfully, from the ancient sect of Christian knights, who also loved cutting and stabbing, comes a new implement that has received my personal blessing, the Templar knife. Like the ancient sword of Excalibur, you don't choose a Templar knife, it chooses you. You just decide what kind you want on the website first, however, and then order it online, and then it chooses you. The Templar knife comes in a variety of shapes. As a man of culture and taste, I have decided I will never use a terrible knife again. And thanks to the inspiration provided by this excellent product, I have decided to launch a new crusade against anyone using less than superior knives. Join me, brothers and sisters, by visiting uppercuttactical.com slash pages slash Templar dash knives. That's a lot of slashes. For that, you'll need a Templar knife. For 10% off, use code AP for Liberty and join me in a quest for glory, for liberty, for Christendom, for the Templar knife. Get yours today. Fire. Yeah.
Your printing company stinks. They charge you too much money, and they don't love America enough. We've got the solution. Patriot Printing USA. Whether you're running for office, saving souls, or just need business cards that will get you the new job you've been looking for, Patriot Printing USA has got you covered with the best prices around. Palm cards, brochures, bumper stickers, door hangers, you name it, we've got it. PatriotPrintingUSA.com. That's PatriotPrintingUSA.com. Want an engaging website to boost your business? You're just a click away from five-star Fiverr talent. Hundreds of freelancer skills like web design. Head to Fiverr.com today and get something started. Average Americans are turning into conspiracy theorists at an unprecedented rate. Flip City Magazine was created for new converts to aid in their in-depth research along the path of absolute truth. We offer the hardest hitting news and opinion delivered uncensored in print directly to your door. Display proudly on your coffee table or hide discreetly under your mattress. Flip City is the magazine they don't want you to see, much less read. Subscribe to Flip City Magazine today at FlipCityMag.com. I would remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. It is better to settle these matters in the courts than on the streets, and new laws are needed at every level. But law alone cannot make men see right. 